That was a great toss, by the way, Pastor Mike. Awesome. How many of you are grateful to be in the house of God today? Come on, where are you at? It is, uh, it is summer, and rather than scale back, we've, we've made a covenant with you, and we want you to make a covenant with us as church. Let's don't scale back. Let's press in. Amen? And let's seek God out this year. I, I believe in the summer months right now, there's an opportunity for us. Um, we're going to kick that off today, that if, if you'll lean in just a little bit, if you'll press in just a little more, that you will, you will not come out of this summer the same. I want you to look at somebody next to you and say, you're never going to be the same after this summer. Go ahead and tell them. You're never going to be the same. And then, and then tell them, I know what you did last summer. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Don't tell them that. All right, hey, let's, let's pray. Let's invite the, the presence of God. We know he's been here in worship. Amen. I'm so thankful for the way God moves in worship. Let's ask for him to be present right now on the preaching of the word. Father in heaven, we thank you today uh, that we get to gather in your house as your sons and your, and your daughters. We pray, Holy Spirit, that your anointing would come now, that it would be on the word, that it would speak to us, that we would be changed, that we would never be the same again because of the way that we, with reverence, yielded ourselves to your word and to your Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, can we just worship Jesus one more time together? Let's do that. This is, this is his meeting. This is his house. So we begin a new series today titled Summer in the Psalms, Summer in the Psalms. And this word Psalm, we're going to be unpacking this over the course of the summer. It comes from a Hebrew word, mizmor, which basically means words accompanied with instruments. There's an emphasis in the Psalms on prayers, praises, and poetic petitions. And, and all of them are designed to be accompanied with music. I, I kind of think of the Psalms... Uh, of the scriptures are what the Beatles are to the golden oldies. Like, even if you're not a huge, like, Beatles fan, ch chances are if it comes on, you're probably going to know one. Same is true with the Psalms. So, like, whatever David and Asaph and the sons of Korah wrote, it's kind of like hearing something familiar that you heard from John Paul and the other two guys who were in the Beatles, right? Um, uh, greatest hits like, she loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> timeline, Golden Oldies. Hey Jude, I want to hold your hand. Yesterday, let it be. All you need is love. You don't have to throw that one in there. And even if you're not a fan in, of the Beatles, if you're somewhere and you hear one of these songs, you're like, you probably start tapping your foot. You, 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 know, you know the melody, it sounds familiar to you. And uh, you might begin to involuntarily sing. And that's true for even a non-musical person. Here, here's kind of the parallel. It's true with the Psalms. They're so woven into our culture that if you hear one, even a non-religious person is like, hey, I've, I've heard that somewhere. I've seen that on a bumper sticker. I've, I've heard that, that teaching somewhere before. Some greatest hits, right? Like Psalm 91, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Psalm 119, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my what? Psalm 42, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after thee. Psalm 55, cast your cares on the Lord, he will sustain you. How many of you love that one? And if you haven't heard any Psalms, you've probably heard Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And see how I'm reading in the King James Version because sometimes it even elicits a little bit of a memory, doesn't it? A little bit of like where you came from. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Let me ask you this. Have you ever asked why do the Psalms have such sticking power? Why do they have such staying power? The book of the Psalms, you may not know this, but the book of Psalms, it is the most read book in the Bible. In fact, many scholars suggest that Jesus referenced or quoted the Psalms more than any other book in the Bible. And he actually used the Psalms to affirm his identity as Messiah. So something significant about the book of Psalms, that if you will get a hold of this, it will change you forever. You will never be 
the same. I want you to see how, how Jesus used the psalm specifically to affirm his identity as Messiah and refute his critics. Look at Matthew 22. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And he said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the spirit, calls him Lord? I want to back up to that, that, that phrase here. I don't want you to miss this. He said, David, speaking by the what? Speaking by the spirit. So when you are in the Psalms, when you are reading, uh, whether you're reading David or Asaph or, or the sons of Korah, even some of those obscure Psalms where you're like, man, that doesn't sound like God of the New Testament. You're actually reading inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes they deal with the inner workings of our humanity, of our world, justice, mercy, judgment, wrath, things that are too deep for us to conceive of. But here, Jesus not only affirms that when Psalms are being spoken, they are spoken by the Spirit, but he also uses this particular Psalm to affirm his identity as Messiah. He goes on to read, this is Psalm 110, by the way. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I Put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could say a word in reply to Jesus. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. By the way, if you want to make the devil shut up, just quote a psalm to him. If you want to shut down your critics, just quote a psalm out loud. And all the psalms run neck to neck with the prophet Isaiah as the most quoted book in the New Testament. And so at least we learned this much about the book of Psalms, about their sticking power. If you're taking notes, write this down. Not only are the Psalms uniquely poetic, they are distinctly prophetic. I want you to understand that. I don't want you to just hear what I said and just say, oh, that's a nice little churchy phrase. I want you to understand exactly what I'm, what's being said here. Uh, the Psalms, they, they, they resonate with us in, in ways that other scriptures do not because of their poetic, artistic nature that God so skillfully gave them to us. Think about this. Emotionally, the Psalms resonate with our struggles in the flesh. And spiritually, they appeal to the heart cry of our soul. I, I think of the Psalms as this. The Psalms are the, the collision of what you feel and what you believe. Can I ask anybody today to be honest, how often in the last weeks, months, years, has what you feel been on a collision course with what you believe? Come on. And this is where the Psalms get so real to us, so filled with revelation, taking us from point A to point B. But watch this, inviting us to go ahead and welcome those feelings to be on that head-on collision with what we believe. How could we define the Psalms in a single phrase? If I tried to give you a single definition, I couldn't do it. But the Psalms define themselves beautifully in a single phrase. Psalms 42, seven, how do we define it in a single phrase? Here it is, deep calls unto deep. Deep calls unto deep. In fact, that is the title of today's message. Turn to someone next to you and say, deep calls unto deep. Just get that out there. Deep calls unto deep. You know, I, I went on a uh, retreat a, a while back and it, the idea was getting away from the world and turning the phone off and just being around other godly men and being in the word and having a journal. And there was a day on this retreat where you were supposed to fast for the whole day. And uh, then you were supposed to pick a place to go outside. There's on this ranch. And you go and you hike and you find a place on this retreat where you can just get away from everything and hear from God. And so... I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get deep today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Psalm 42.7 today. Deep calls unto deep. And so I head out of that, that cabin we were in on that, that retreat, and I, I find this creek, and I, I go down to that creek, and I'm whispering, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deep today. Deep calls unto deep. And I see this crystal clear water flowing about knee high. And uh, it was hot enough, so I decided to just wade out into the water 
towards this, this huge majestic boulder that's, that's out there in the middle and the water hits the back of this boulder and it splits and it goes, it goes both ways around it. The sound of the, the bubbling of, of the water. Can you hear it? Are you there with me? And, and, and I'm seeing this and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the spiritual place where I'm going to meet with God. I'm going to go out there deep, cause on to deep. And so I'm waiting with Bible and journal in hand and uh, I get almost to that that boulder, that throne where God's gonna come meet me, right? And I, I lose my footing in that creek, go flat on my back and kadoosh, just water sprays everywhere. The Bible's waterlogged, the, the journal's waterlogged. And I, I, you ever done this when you're really embarrassed how fast you move afterwards? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? After something embarrassing happens, you're like flash. I came out of that water so fast, and although I was in the middle of nowhere, I immediately looked around to see who saw me, because I don't struggle with pride or anything. Um, and and I, I heard God say, stop trying to be so spiritual. Stop trying to be so deep. Now, in humility, I did manage to climb onto that boulder like a wet cat. D calls unto D. That'd be a good cologne, wouldn't it? D calls, a little, little mantra. Wet cat was a logo. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm on this boulder, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking terrible, pitiful. I'm completely humbled before God. My, my Bible is, the pages are stuck together. Uh, the journal, the, the, the ink has begun to run. And, uh, and I laughed and I said, okay, God, this is your meeting. How many know this is his meeting? And, and, and God, because he has a sense of humor, he said, now read the second part of Psalm 42, seven. You're going to love this. And here's what it says. All your waves and billows have gone over me. <laughs> tell someone next to you, stop trying to be so spiritual. Go ahead, tell them. Cause they're trying. If they aren't right now, they, they may be pretending like it later. Here's why you don't have to try and get deep with God. You already are. I want you to understand this. You don't have to try to be so spiritual. You already are. You already are. Listen to Psalm 139, 13 through 16. God created your inmost being. Receive this today like you've never heard it. Oh, come on, somebody. Is the word living and active? Let it come alive and activate something in today about your spiritual depth. You were created by God, your inmost being. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your frame was not hidden from him when he made you in the secret place, when you were woven together in the depths. Somebody say in the depths. In the depths of the earth, God saw your unformed body. All the days were ordained for you, written in his book, before one of them came to be. Do you believe that about yourself? If you do, my friend, you are deep. You are more spiritual than you ever realize. I mean, it doesn't get much more spiritual than that. You know what our attempt to go deep with God looks like? Like that wet cat climbing on a rock. So what then? Receive this today. God is not waiting for you to go deep with him He's waiting for you to get real with him. I think we all go through phases where we're like, yeah, yeah, we need to go deeper. We need to go deeper. If you've been in church long enough, you might be guilty of this. I just feel like we don't go deep enough. <laughs> I've said it. I know this is hard to believe as a lead pastor now of New Tribe, but I was once the argumentative person that was talking in the background, man, we just don't go deep in this church anymore. Seminary will do that to you. You don't have to go, you don't have to try and be deep, try to be spiritual. You already are. And so what's God waiting for? He's not waiting for you to get deep. He's waiting for you to get real with him. You want to go deep? Get real with God. I'm talking about real as you can get. What does it look like lived out practically? Here's, here's, here's a step. You know the phrase, mean what you say, say what you mean? Or say what you mean, mean what you say? 
Let's spiritualize that a little bit. Pray what you mean and mean what you pray. We opened up talking about how the Psalms, they hit on these areas of prayer, praise, poetic petition. And I want to just focus on this element of prayer. Before we step into that, I want you to just, I want you to get the raw nature of what what I'm trying to say here. Pray what you mean and mean what you pray. Nobody throws a cooked steak on the grill. Well, some of you might, and you don't know what you're doing. Stop it. No, that's not how it's done. It's raw meat on the fire. Let me try this side. It's raw meat on the fire. Ah. (laughs) Why? We're talking about something that's authentic, something that's raw. If it's thrown on the fire long enough and you trust God to cook it a little bit, something amazing is going to come out on the other end. We're talking about authentic prayer. And no other book of the Bible demonstrates this more than the Psalms. Listen to these right here. Psalm, these are, these are, these are raw stake on the fire prayers. Psalm 13, one, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 43, why have you rejected me? Why must I go on mourning oppressed by the enemy? Psalm 119, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Psalm 119, 82, my eyes fell looking for your promise they're always talking about. I say, when will you comfort me? Psalm 73, 12, 73, 4, excuse me. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. (laughs) Who would be so bold to say, I've done it. He goes on to say, they have no struggles. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. Psalm 73, 12, this is what the the wicked are like, always carefree. They go on amassing their wealth. Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure. Oh my gosh, that just hits so real, doesn't it? So raw, so authentic. Psalm 12, excuse me, Psalm 73, 14, All day long I have been afflicted. This is wild to me. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning, does it bring new mercy? No, look what it says, brings new punishments. How many have been there? Raw prayers, Psalm 12, one through two. Help Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. By the way, this is probably penned 3,000 years ago. I know it feels like this sometimes, but I'm just saying that, that our feelings and our beliefs have been on a collision course since God created us. No one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. You thought you were the first one to feel that way? Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips, harbor deception in their hearts. Now, come on, it doesn't get any more real than these prayers, does it? These are not eloquent prayers, and sometimes they even seem to lack reverence. But you know what? They're real, and you can feel them, can't you? Let those raw prayers cook on the fire of God. Here's something true about raw prayers. Our deepest prayers are often more authentic than eloquent. I'm talking about soul cries, man, like, I'm talking, let me just talk to some men in here for a second. I'm talking about going on a walk and airing it out with your father. Come on. Women, weeping over your children or the state of the world that you have to raise them in and just letting God know how you feel about it. Our deepest prayers are often more authentic than eloquent. David, Asaph, the sons of Korah, whoever's being mentioned in the Psalms, they demonstrate this all throughout the Psalms. But here's the difference, say, between David's prayer life and ours. David wasn't afraid to push God. Some of you heard this acronym, push God, to pray until something happens. You want to go deep? Don't be afraid to push God. Oh, that sounds kind of irreligious. Hold on with me. 
That sounds kind of irreverent. No, no, no. Don't be afraid to push God. You can pretend to say what you want to say in your prayer, but he already knows how you feel about it before you open your mouth. Is he the God who's real? But this, this pushing, this getting real in your prayers, it's not about getting your way. It's about getting into his presence. This is so important. And the Psalms model this kind of prayer for us. This prayer that, that we, we keep pushing, the kind of prayers that release from us that frustration, emotionally drenched complaints, desperate pleas, these penitent prayers, screams of pain that expose the yearnings of our deepest thoughts, right? When we can't make sense of our faith or the world, we push. And this is what's exemplified to us in, in the Psalms, to, to pray until something happens. Here's what it looks like. Let me, let me give you something. Look at Psalm 73, beginning in verse 16. He said this, when I tried to understand all of this, when I tried to understand the corruption, come on, the moral decline, the evil, the deception, the lies, the hurt, but when I tried to understand my, my anger, even my envy of the wicked, when I tried to understand what I'm seeing on the TV, what I'm hearing in social media, what's happening all throughout our nation, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. You see, you're already deep and more spiritual than you realize. Sometimes the things that trouble you in the depth of your soul are a reminder to how deep you truly are. When I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply so I kept pushing I kept pressing and then something happened look at the last part of the verse till I entered the sanctuary of God with my understanding all of the corruption and the moral decline the division the deception the lies the anger the envy I I tried to understand all of this. It troubled me deeply until I stepped into the presence of God. I want you to get this today. Time spent getting into the presence is time saved getting out of your understanding. And sometimes you gotta push to get to that place. Air your grief before God. Bring your raw, real prayers. Come on. I'm talking about instead of posting it on social media, airing it out to God. Instead of trying to rally together a couple of Christians who hold your conservative views by putting a meme or a post somewhere where everyone goes, yes, yes, amen. I'm talking about take that thing that deeply troubles you and say, God, when are you going to do something about this? If we weren't as preoccupied with the reactions of men, we might actually hear the response of God. Because we would take those things that deeply trouble us and stop walking around in our plastic faith and say, God, what on earth is happening? And you push and you push and you pray and say, I don't understand it. I can't get my mind around it. And as you push and as you push and you say, why God, why? Then suddenly he will begin to respond and you will enter into the sanctuary. And his peace will come over you. His presence will wash over you. His love will wash over you. Child, I know you don't understand it. There's kids in here today. Kids run to, your, to, the, to the parents, don't they? Parents, they really run to you. They don't understand what's going on. You hold them and you say, it's okay. You can't explain it to them. Even if you could, they wouldn't get it. But they know this, your embrace, it's okay. And they will push to get into your presence. Come on, parents. They will unlock the door to come into your bedroom. They will figure out a way to find you so that you will hold them. And is God not a father? Learn to pick the lock to his door. <laughs> Learn to sneak into his secret place and say, oh, I need you. What's wrong, what's wrong? I don't know, just hold me. On a serious note, what you see in these, these raw emotional prayers 
as you see an example that we lose, we, we, we've lost hold of this because of our piety. As if we could impress God with our approach. But last time I heard, we boldly approach the throne of grace. You know why? Because we're a mess. <laughs> so that time spent pushing, getting into the presence is time saved, getting out of your understanding. Our understanding has limitations. That's where worry is. You want to know where worry is found? Right here in your understanding. And who can add a single hour to their lives by worrying? Jesus said nobody. Our understanding without God, that's where anxiety lives. But in the presence, raw human emotion met with the authentic cry of your soul. In the presence, that is where deep calls unto deep. You know, I believe that uh, we could possibly be entering into a long summer. I mean, the headlines already are brutal, aren't they? And I believe we could see more over this summer throughout the remainder of the year than we're really, we're probably not looking forward to what we will see. A roller coaster of emotions followed by Unhelpful, unhelpful opinions on social media and raging mobs in the street. Please hear me, church. Save yourself some energy. Don't push into the chaos. Push into the presence. Let me say it this way. We don't live in reaction to the headlines. We live in response to the resurrection. There was a horrible tragedy that happened in Uvalde, Texas. I'm not going to mention it. One of the victims would have turned 10 this weekend. Her father shared something she had posted on TikTok just a few days prior. She was sharing the gospel with her friends. Check this out. Hey, guys. Um, I just want to give you a little touch up. Jesus, he died for us, so when we die, we'll be up there for him. In my room, I have three pictures of him. Hey, guys. She said, um, I just want when we to die, we'll be with him. I have three pictures of him in my room. You see, the headlines make no mention of those who have hope in the resurrection. And I wasn't going to share this with you, but her father shared this. You know why? Because it speaks of the light in the darkness. It speaks of our hope in the resurrection. And it shows the raw response of a father who is grieving in anguish, who yet says, I want the world to see this. <laughs> deep is calling unto deep. Shallow faith will not sustain the time's coming as the return of Christ draws near. But that doesn't mean you gotta try to be more spiritual. That doesn't mean you, try to gotta, you gotta try to be more deep. It simply means this, you step into the raw, real you before God and you grieve before him and you moan before him. And when you see something you don't agree with and you don't like, you can go and you can make a big scene about it so people applaud you, or you can go into the secret place where your father dwells and say, why, oh God, how come these things are happening? And you can push and you can push and you can push. And no matter what you're facing through in life, this is not a promise, this is a guarantee. The presence of the father will come and he will overshadow you. Jesus in his burial descended into the depths, took the keys away from Hades, and he, he lives forevermore. He's exalted at the right hand of God, and those who believe in him shall never taste death. That is our message. Our, our hope is in the greatest message that the world has ever known. You, you want to go deep? Just keep airing out all of your grief before God. He can handle it. But don't fill your news feed with hopelessness and despair. Let the world know 
We have a God who hears. Come on. Let the world know when I try to understand all these things at some point, I just get to a place where I have to get into the presence of God. You want to push back the darkness, push into the presence. And that is where deep calls unto deep. I want to end today doing something a little bit different. You know that, that saying, practice what you preach? I want you to practice what I just preached. Y'all okay with that? I want you to go straight up grieving psalm kind of prayers before God with me in this room. I want you to take every negative reaction, feeling, hurt, trouble, the thing that's deeply troubled you in, in the recent times, and I want you to join me right now, and I want us to air out our grief before God. What are we looking for? His response. What's our aim? To get into his presence. Will you stand with me? And try not to shuffle around, move too much, and service isn't over just yet. And I'm just gonna ask you guys just turn up the keys just a little bit because I'm gonna ask you to pray out loud. I'm gonna ask you to really air some stuff out before God. And I'll start you, you ready? And then I'm gonna show you how you end a session of throwing that raw meat on the fire. <laughs> so right now, just all over this room, I want you to begin expressing those things that are, that are angering you. Let's start right there. What's got you angered right now? Come on, get real before God. Take it to the Lord, go ahead. Is it government? Come on, tell him right now what you're angry about. Is it what's happening in public schools around the nation? Tell him, tell him right now. Don't act like you don't have any anger. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. This means you got it. What are the things that frustrate you? Talk to grief, air your frustrations before God. I'm so frustrated about this one thing. Tell them right now. <laughs> Worry. Parents, you got your kids in here with you right now. Now's the opportunity to see God break something off their life. Extend your head towards them. Tell God what you're worried about when it comes to their lives. I'm worried about what they're being taught. I'm worried about what's out there in social media. I'm worried about what's being thrown out in front of them. I feel like if I don't retreat and go to a mountain somewhere and raise them in my living room, that God, they're gonna be exposed to darkness. No, 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 they're going to expose the darkness because his light's going to shine on them. Pain, what painful things have you dealt with lately? Real pain, things that hurt, which you have no words for. Let God right now know right now how you feel about that and what hurts but it hurts I just wish you would take it away remember this is the place where your feelings and your belief come into a head-on collision one last one anxiety what are you anxious about be honest the economy oh come on inflation be real before God Quit trying to be so spiritual, trying to be so deep. What's got you anxious? What's keeping you up at night? Have you been laid off? You worried about your standard of living dropping down? We bring these anxieties before you. God, how long must we endure? How long will we have to see and feel this hopelessness and despair? Now, like I said earlier, what was different about the psalmist in our prayers? is that no matter what they're airing out before God, what they're grieving, they push, they pray until something happens. I tried to understand all of this. Just tell the Lord that, oh Lord, I've been trying to understand all this, but then I entered into your sanctuary. And I don't wanna read you Psalm 75 because this is usually how it ends. It never ends in grief, it always ends in praise. Psalm 75, we praise you, God. <laughs> Oh, come on, lift your hands and praise him. We praise you for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. The Lord has said, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all of its people quake, it is I who uphold its pillars firm. 
There's this little word after that psalm that says Selah. And you know what it means? It means to lift up. So all of our grief, God, all of our worry, our anxiety, our pain, the things that devastate, that deeply trouble us, we proclaim today deep has called unto deep and that your presence is in this place. We don't end with our grief, but we end by lifting you up, a selah, a shout of praise and thanksgiving to the faithfulness of our God. Come on, worship him. Thank him for his goodness. We worship you, Lord.